This is going to be a study of Galatians chapter 2. And while we look at Galatians chapter 2, we're also going to look at a topic. And the topic is, why can't we be friends? You know, all people want to do today is badmouth each other, bite and devour one another, expose each other. But if we're believers and we believe, you know, the fundamentals that we need to believe to be a Christian, why can't we be friends? And the first thing is, why can't we be friends with Christians of different races? You hear all this talk about racial stuff, and I hate to talk about racial things, but since that's what everybody's talking about today, I'm going to talk about it. Why can't we be friends with Christians of different races? Galatians 2, 1 through 3, you're going to see Paul is Christians, is, is friends with Christians of different races. He says in Galatians 2, 1 through 3, Then fourteen years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So Paul didn't choose to be a lone ranger. He was going up to Jerusalem to talk to the big three. And that the big three is Peter, James, and John. And so he came in a group of three himself, him, Barnabas, and Titus. And something significant is that Titus was a different race. Titus was a different race. He was an uncircumcised Gentile. Why can't you be friends with Christians of a different race? Why can't you be friends with Christians of a different race if the Apostle Paul can? In Galatians 3.28, he says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're a Christian, no matter what race you are, you are a member of the body of Christ. So why can't you be friends with Christians of a different race? Next, why can't you be friends with Christians of high reputation? Look back at Galatians 2, one and 2.2. 2. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation. So the Lord told him to go up and communicated unto them that gospel. You can find that gospel in 1 Corinthians 15.1-4. That gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Because the Apostle Paul was the Apostle to the Gentiles. And he says, But privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So who were the ones of reputation? The big three. Peter, James, and John. It says in Galatians 2.6, if you go down a few verses, Galatians 2.6, it says, But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. In the eyes of God, all born-again believers are equal and have their part in the body of Christ. It is only down here that Christians have respect of persons. However, there are many Christians who are self-conscious and will not acknowledge or have anything to do with a Christian who is of a high reputation because they're self-conscious of themselves. They feel like that Christian's better than them. And there's people that look down on people that's got a higher reputation than them and won't have anything to do with them because they can't stand being around somebody that they themselves think is better than them deep down. But I believe most of this is simply because of jealousy. The Apostle Paul says, But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. So you can see that Paul is heavenly minded in this aspect. He didn't see Peter, James, and John as such big shots that they were just unproachable. A lot of people see these big time preachers and think, man, they're just unproachable. They're better than I am. Even though the, these were the men who walked and talked with Jesus Christ, Paul didn't feel like he couldn't approach them. He also didn't look at them with jealousy to the point that he wouldn't fellowship with them. Because he knew with God, there's no respect of persons. God accepteth no man's person. 
It says in James 2, 9, But if you have respect of persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. You should never feel like another Christian is too much of a Christian celebrity for you to be able to approach that Christian. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul didn't feel like Peter, James, and John that walked and talked with Jesus that had been saved longer than he was. Uh, Peter that had so many saved in Acts chapter 2, he didn't think, man, I can't approach him. I can't talk to him about the, the gospel that I'm preaching. He didn't think that way. In Galatians 2, 7, it says, But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. You see, this doesn't mean Paul and Peter had different gospels. They were simply preaching the same gospel to different groups of people. For example, if you're a missionary to Africa, your burden is to the people of Africa. Mine is to America. We have different groups we are preaching the gospel to, but it's the same gospel that we're both preaching. That's the case with Paul and Peter. It wasn't two separate gospels. They just had a burden and had a, or had a ministry to two different groups. Now, Galatians 2, eight For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Peter took the gospel to the circumcision. The circumcision was referring to the Jews. Paul took it to the uncircumcision, referring to the Gentiles. Even though Paul's serious burden was for his kinsmen according to the flesh, the Jews, he was the apostle to the Gentiles. In Galatians 2.9, it says, and when James Cephas, which is Peter, and when James Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. So Peter, James, and John didn't think that they were too good. They didn't think that they were so good that they couldn't fellowship with Paul and Barnabas and Titus. And... Paul and Barnabas and Titus didn't uh, feel so unconfident that they couldn't even approach these men of high reputation. And Paul himself had a high reputation with the Pharisees before he was saved. At the same time, he had a bad reputation with the church. None of the men mentioned that we've mentioned, none of them let these things get in the way of their fellowship. They gave to each other the right hands of fellowship. And Paul even rebukes Peter in this chapter. But they continue to be friends. As you'll see if you read uh, Peter's epistle, he speaks highly of Paul. But in Galatians 2.11, Paul says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I was stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Paul didn't run behind his back and talk about him. He didn't write, write a mean Facebook post that had enough details to let everyone know he was talking about Peter. He withstood him to his face. And he says in verse 12, For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So before some Jews showed up to the party, Peter was eating with the Gentiles. And when the Jews showed up, he separated because he feared his reputation among men. In Galatians 2.13, it says, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. You always affect other people. Peter affected the men around him. You never only hurt yourself. And it says, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Peter was setting a horrible example. When the Jews showed up, he separated from the Gentiles to make it look like he was keeping the law. He made it look like keeping the law still mattered in regards to salvation. And if he's going to be a New Testament Christian and live without being in bondage to the law, then why is he going to make the Gentiles think that he is still keeping the law just because the Jews showed up? Even though Paul rebukes Peter, Peter is still friends with Paul. He even writes of him in his epistle in 2 Peter 3.15 and says, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, 
hath written unto you. Why can't we be friends with Christians of high reputation? At the same time, why can't we be friends with Christians that can't offer us anything? Why can't we be friends with Christians that can't offer us anything? In Galatians 2.10, it said, Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Some Christians are so jealous of the high-reputation Christians that they won't fellowship with them, while others think they're so good that they won't have anything to do with the poor saints. But in James 2, 9, it says, But if ye have respect of persons, ye commit sin. If you can't be friends with a poor man, then it would be hard for you to be friends with Jesus Christ. Because in Luke 9, 58, it says, And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Something I don't understand is why you can't be friends with any separated believer. They may not have nice clothes now, but at the rapture, they're going to have the same ones you have. They may stink now, but at the second coming, they'll have a horse that smells better than you do. They have the same father as you do. A poor person said he couldn't go to church because all the rich Christians look down on his clothes. And what does the Bible say about that? In James 2, 1 through 4, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto you your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? It's wrong to make odds between the rich man and the poor man. If they are Christians, and they are members of the same body, so why can't we be friends with the poor saints? Peter, James, and John told Paul there in Galatians 2.10, Remember the poor. And Paul said the same, that's the same which I also was forward to do. Paul was remembering the poor. He wasn't looking down on the poor saints. Peter, James, and John weren't looking down on the poor saints. Now the next one, why can't we be friends with Christians with right doctrine? If a Christian's got the right doctrine and he's living a separated Christian life, there's no reason why you couldn't be friends with him. So the rest of this study will just show you the right doctrine concerning salvation that every Christian needs to be aware of. As you know, there were people going around saying that you had to be circumcised and believe on Jesus Christ at the same time to be saved instead of just receiving Jesus Christ. They thought you had to be circumcised and keep the law. They were go going around saying that you had to believe and keep the law to be saved. And men do the same thing today. Nowadays, they say you have to be water baptized and believe on Jesus Christ to be saved. They add water baptism to the simple gospel. And Paul says in Romans 16, 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Now, there are some people, some Christians, we shouldn't fellowship with. There were some people that Paul wouldn't fellowship with. And if you go back to Galatians 2, 3 through 5, he mentions them, and he actually calls them false brethren. In Galatians 2, 3 and 4, it says, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, though there's his Christian friend of a different race he's still friends with, neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Paul knows that circumcision means nothing when it comes to salvation. And then he says in verse 4, And that because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in privily despite our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Sometimes the false brethren come in unawares, right under your nose, and begin to cause trouble. The last thing I want to do is cause trouble in the church. And these false brethren come in privily, secretly. They began to take away the liberty of the saints, adding circumcision 
and keeping the law of Moses to the perfect gospel. This is someone you should not hang around. Notice what Paul says next. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Notice it says, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. Paul didn't give them the time of day. He didn't give them place because if he did, he might as well save a seat for Satan. But he said in Ephesians 4.27, Neither give place to the devil. In contrast to this bad doctrine by these religious hypocrites, let's look at the right doctrine. Why can't we be friends with Christians who have the right doctrine? Despite our other differences. Now, you're going to have some disagreements on things among Christian friends. However, it should never be a huge disagreement about something major. For example, like adding works to the simple gospel. But now Paul is going to show you the right doctrine. Look down at verse 15. Galatians 2.15 We who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles. Now Paul is using the word sinner here in the sense of an extremely wicked person. And not in the sense of Romans 23 which simply says for all have sinned and come true to the glory of God. You see sometimes in the Bible, especially in the, in the Old Testament... And you see it in the Gospels, too, where when they call someone a sinner, they're referring to an extremely wicked person and not in the sense of Romans 23 where Paul is saying that everybody's a sinner. So it's also good to note that, that Paul still claims to be a Jew by nature. He said, we who are Jews by nature. Spiritually speaking, he's neither Jew nor Greek. But physically, he is still a Jew. Throughout his epistles, he describes himself as a Hebrew an Israelite, he says he is of the stock of Israel, says the Jews are his kinsmen according to the flesh, says he's the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. And you can look at 2 Corinthians 11.22, Philippians 3.5, Romans 11.1, 1, and Romans 9.3, and see those references. But Paul says, we who are Jews by nature. But here is the right doctrine concerning salvation. That he's going to tell you in Galatians 2.16. He says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The two great things we see in this verse is no one is justified by the works of the law. In Acts thirteen thirty seven through 39, it says, But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So nobody's justified by the law. In Romans 9, 31 through 32, it says, But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. So you, you're not getting to heaven by keeping the works. You need to have good works, but you're not getting to heaven by your own works. You're justified by faith, of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans 4, 5 through 8, it says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You're justified by faith. Paul says in Galatians 2.17, But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. If a saved person lives for the flesh and lives a life of sin, it's not the Lord's fault. Paul was accused of teaching that since we are saved by grace through faith, that we should just live however we want to live. And that is what 
Bible believers are accused of today. Paul was slanderously reported in this way. In Romans 3, 8, it says, And not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, Let us do evil, that good may come, whose damnation is just. They were going around saying that Paul was saying, Let us do evil, that good may come. They were going around saying, well, he thinks we can do whatever we want to since we're saved. But Paul didn't preach you should just go do whatever you want to. We shouldn't abuse salvation by living for the flesh. We shouldn't take it for granted or take advantage of it. You're free from the law in the sense that you don't have to keep the law to be saved. You're free from the law in the sense that you don't have to keep the Sabbath or abstain from meats, certain meats. You can eat anything you want to as long as you can give thanks for it. And things like that. However, when it comes to living holy, you should strive to be as perfect as you can. Paul was standing up for the fact that a Christian has liberty and doesn't have to be in bondage to the law. That means he was preaching against the men who were requiring circumcision and law-keeping. So Paul says in verse 18, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Now, what did Paul destroy? We'll look back at Galatians 1.13. It says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Then he says in Galatians 1.23, But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. Paul destroyed the faith of the church as a lost man, now he is building it up. And to the lost religious crowd, he becomes a transgressor by not teaching circumcision and keeping the law for salvation. So that's why he said, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, which will be the church, I make myself a transgressor. But he says in verse 19, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. You see, when you got saved, you became dead to the law. Jesus Christ died for our breaking of the law, and this satisfied the penalty of breaking the law. And, uh, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. But Jesus Christ paid that sin debt for us. And when you, when you got saved, you died with Jesus Christ. However, at the same time, you came alive. And this is why Paul says in the next verse, I am crucified with Christ. So you died with him. Nevertheless, I live. Yet you came to life at the same time because he resurrected. So he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul said that Christ liveth in me. This is a mystery. Jesus Christ dwells in our sinful bodies. Colossians 1, 26 through 27 says... Even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what, what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ goes wherever you go. Not only is he omnipresent, but he also lives in you. Paul also said that, he, that the Lord loved me and gave himself for me. In Galatians 1, 4, he says, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. John three sixteen said, For God so loved the world that he gave. You see, love is giving and not getting. Ephesians five twenty five, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. If a husband isn't willing to give his life for his wife, then he messes up the picture. Jesus Christ gave himself for the church, his bride. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He gave himself a ransom for all men. It wasn't just a few men as the Calvinists teach us. 
Titus 2, 13 and 14, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Jesus Christ gave himself as the payment for sin, and all you have to do is accept the payment. Righteousness comes through believing on him and his finished work on the cross. You don't get to heaven by circumcision or by any other form of keeping the law. It is all by faith. And this is why Paul says in verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So he's saying if you could establish your own righteousness and get to heaven through your own goodness, then Jesus Christ died in vain. He died for no reason of all at all. But these people that were going around saying that you had to be circumcised and keep the law, they were ignorant of the Lord's righteousness. And Romans 10, 3 says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So Paul laid out clearly how to be saved, what salvation is for us today in the New Testament. And he laid it out very clearly. And if someone is a born-again, separated believer with that kind of right doctrine, why can't you be friends with them? Why do you have to throw your nose up in the air? Why do you have to be so hard on everybody and judge them so much to the point you have no Christian friends at all? Why can't we be friends?